and they probably got email for me. So we're gonna get started. We've got uh, Carl and Richard from Velocity, and we're gonna give some talk. Reliance. All right, Velocity is a conference we have a coupon for over there, and some stickers. And we also have a trivia where you're gonna win some T-shirts and the laptops. All right, guys. Hello, everyone. Uh, we'll start talking loudly. Uh, there's no mic, but if you can't hear, especially in the back, feel free to raise your hand or say something. Uh, Carl also has a little bit of a cold, so if she passes out in the conference discussion, that's why. The, uh, obviously, we're talking today about operating uh, at scale with public and separate it from code. I'll uh, we'll go quickly into this, this can be a pretty deep technical dive if you guys want, and I encourage questions throughout. Don't feel, uh, feel free to interrupt. Uh, there's two of us who can help the field. Just real quickly um, about the lines. Um, it's our standard marketing group. The thing to know about what we do is uh, we sell a client uh, that's a converged infrastructure solution, meaning it's a box that our customers who today are mostly large retailers put in their stores to deliver, to aggregate multiple services that are typically done by separate systems. So the functionality might be uh, security controls, uh, networking, uh, hosting applications, uh, hosting entire virtual machines and the like. And uh, it's very similar to what you see people today doing uh, in data centers with VMware and other solutions uh, for software-defined infrastructure in general. Uh, the difference between what we do is it's very purposely built for, for stores and small offices and things like that. The reason this is at scale is because most of our customers are large retailers like Hudson News and Party City and Home Market. Barnes & Noble, uh, College Home Sellers, Gucci, you know, Arby's, uh, on the board of the restaurant chain, and a bunch of others. Uh, we have more than 4,500 physical systems deployed, and we do a lot of virtualization. So this really translates to more than 12,000 virtual. And the key, one of our key, you know, you know, sort of successes in all of this is that these are fully managed by Puppet. And when I mean by fully managed, it's a very, very big manifest. We manage all aspects of the configuration, uh, from the hypervisor level all the way up through how applications are provisioned uh, down. Um, today, you know, most of our systems are all Linux-based, Debian Linux. Um, we have a growing number of customers that are now running the Type 1 hypervisor KVM or running the Windows guests, and we'll be extending that full managed layer um, via Puppet, via Windows, into the Windows domain as well. It's going to be very, very nice end-to-end -end solution. So, to not get into too much of the background, because it's very specific to us, and this talk is designed to be very general about how we sort of separate data from code to create operations at scale. But the only other thing I'll, I'll say you know, on this is that the you know, end to end management is the key to success. When you have a thousand stores or more, um, keeping all those configurations in line and managed is a huge challenge. Um, we do that with Puppet, and that's one of the main reasons we're here talking today. It's part of the fact that we've made over the last you know, uh, nearly five years really extensive use of Puppet to a very you know, early on. And Puppet has given us a lot back, and we're here to give what we can back by sharing sort of what we know and how we do it. If it helps anyone, fantastic. So that I'm going to turn to this over to Carla. Um, she gave this very talk, by the way, at, uh, at Puppet Con. Um, I guess it was like three weeks ago or something like that. Yeah. So if you've heard it before because you were out there, there's a couple things that have changed. And um, you know, you're going to get it. So when we started growing our infrastructure team, we saw that means in this environment. So it's all about time. It's the time that you have the need to but at that time you know that you have to deploy and more nodes is coming to your infrastructure until you have the first puppet run without errors because it is really common you start running puppet and then all errors come from it and coming from it. And then you're going to be telling starting to turn your One point here. So, what really 
base public configuration, there really isn't any distinction made, but there, in fact, when you're matching you know, system settings and values that might be different across different systems, yet the code which, which you're using, you know, like a firewall rule or a network adapter setting or a very basic thing, those don't necessarily change the code. The data, the actual IP address, the firewall rule, or whatever, might have a lot of variability. What we found when we got when we were started operating at real scale, you know, beyond two, three, four, five thousand nodes, is that changes in data were happening a whole lot quicker than changes in code were. But as long as we were tied to having all of this done monolithically, it led to release after release after release, and you know, associated challenges, with performance, manageability, and a lot of other things. So this really drove us down the path of needing to separate data from code. Once, and that's what there are tools from the environment to do that today. So, and also, besides that, your month is going to take really long to So, uh, what I said, we have to separate those things. We don't want to keep contained on under our Git tree the changes in data, and also the changes on the one pass on the phone. So, we split it up.
don't have any specific data for that, no, it will fall down to the full value. So you just declare the common, what is common for every node, and then just if you have any different special configuration, just declare for that node or for the group of nodes. And you can add as much as that would have if you want. So I am calling for example the higher DNS. We're trying to carry our DNS server from our node. He's going to try first uh, to retrieve from the backend the my server. Let's suppose that the host name is my server. If it doesn't have there, it will call down to my group and then if it doesn't have anything, it will get the local back. Right, this is a classical example of higher obviously comes from hierarchical, so we're just we're using it's the hierarchical, we're matching the way we're storing the data uh, in Redis, the hierarchical format to what hierarchy expects to have. It's a nice easy thing. So that is good because we can just not manage the data, the variables on the manifest, but it's still it wasn't a better way to put it because we still have to go to the manifest and declare a new node or declare a new type definition. So for that we develop this entire resource function. So it will get, it will get the dynamically the resource from the back end. We serialize the resource. We are, we are using JSON for that. And then the, the function will magically create the resource on the back end. So, um, just a, a simple example. There is one that and just store these. It, it is just two resources called time one and time two. Called time. That is starting into Redis. And then by calling the higher resource message, it is in the output. It realizes the both resources. So you don't even need to declare the multiplier types on your multiplier. So. so before Carl leaves higher resources, I'll just say that. We built higher resources last year before um, before lab, the 2012 Puppet Comp. And we went there and talked to you know the folks at Puppet Labs about it. They and so we were hoping that maybe they just would accept it and put it into you know core because it's kind of nice because you can do you know you can use higher now to instance entire resources instead of just dealing with them. They didn't like it. They think that the resources stuff should belong as, as part of the DSL and DSL only. So it's sitting out there. You're welcome to use it. We find it immensely valuable in our so a quick question. So how is higher resources different from create resources? And also I agree that data should be in the code and not or code resources should be in the code and not the data. I'll talk about that later. Right. How is the difference? Create resources only DSL. With create you can get the data from higher. It's just convenient. It's convenient for us to be able to associate resources and their data in close proximity to each other and use the database to do it. We could use green resources to do it in DSL and have those things be part of the manifest, but for us, it gives us the flexibility of manifest. High resources uses green resources. It takes the data from. Okay, so you basically mix like the higher call plus green yeah. resources. Yes. Gotcha. So, this is an example of our format that we developed. Um, it's called the Enormous opportunity for us, which is 
it means that the systems administrator doesn't have to be the one to manage the system anymore. You could give functionality to other user groups through the, through the web-based front-end um, to be able to make changes to the environment. They don't have to do anything about Puppet. You can apply, as you'll find out very quickly here, change controls, um, change history if you want, uh, you know, val data validation, all kinds of functions, and of course, access controls to give, them, to give the right level of user the right access to the data. And that starts to get really powerful if you're in the service of the space.
front and I'm not going to go back and switch to the front and front end, right? So we are, so the, um, one of the things we're, we're, we just introduced is the ability to, to track changes of the data in the database, which sounds simple, but the data, these data sets are complicated, they're hierarchical, you've got to figure out what's actually changing, when it's changing. And it does tie closely to Puppet. So in Puppet, as I think a lot of people you know, have found out, you don't, you never roll back the changes. You just roll forward to okay. again and again and again. And it's going to end up being the same thing relative to how we manage database changes as well. So it wouldn't really be necessarily go back to the snapshot and expect it to work. Because this data then gets grabbed by Puppet, written out to whatever, you know, whether it's 10 or 10,000 clients, and then what's going to happen is if you decide you don't like what just happened, you've got to go back in and rechange the data to the database. And there may be some programmatic ways to do that, going back from the data that you have before. But it's not sort of returning to the snapshot, for sure. So I don't think we're really encrypting any data in the database, you know, today. 
Um, it, that's a great sort of, you know, sort of feature application if you wanted to. Um, we obviously take basic steps. We don't store private keys, you know, in the database itself. We use the information. So users, obviously, we use you know, standard, you know, public private key pairs. They get to put their public keys in the database, but not their private keys for these types of applications. And if we did, all, you know, again, if we're looking to, you know, scale this out even further, I think deciding what adding the encryption layer probably would make sense in certain areas. How do you deal with um, separating the, the data out for different customers? So you have a single repository for all your that's manifest. Yeah, that's, that's an excellent more. question. What happens actually is that every customer of ours, so we took one of our customers, let's say Gucci and Chanel, who are competitors with both customers of ours, each one gets their own Redis database. And at the master level, we do replication you know, down to their individual databases. So you have a single source of, you have a master copy and then they modify it, or do they, they have, they have just they are data set, you know, which runs. So the actual hierarchy of our is laid out is in, in, up in Amazon, you know, we have like those databases running in separate instances. We replicate down their data to uh, a server that's probably their data center for the customers. But it's, there, there's, you know, Separation is very strong and available. Their Redis database, no one else's, and, it's, you know, and they have it in their environment, the one that actually gets used for their systems. And then they have their own front end, or is that? The front end is, is, is global, it's, 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 so they log in with their access credentials and they see access to their data and their data. <laughs> Yeah. 
Yeah, Puppet, we use Puppet is always running in our environment, and so we definitely recommend that for everybody. Um, and the number of times Puppet will run on an individual system will depend a lot on sort of where it is. We've got customers out in like New Mexico that are running gas stations, and they're using BSAT. Um, it's horribly slow, with huge latency. So they might, their Puppet might be scheduled to run once every couple of days, or once every couple times a day. But we have other customers that are, you know, have fast bandwidth to their locations, and the public might run three times an hour every 20 minutes. That's for that's to update individual systems, sort of pre standard thing. The front end itself, though, is much more like a web application. We've got branches, we've got, you know, basically everybody goes to the same, you know, standard code set for that. It's universal. Different customers that have different features within the front end. So some of our customers have applications that they have managed, and they only functionality within the front end to allow them to manage those applications. They'll see that stuff because it's enabled within their instance, but it's a common single web application set with you know dev, QA, staging, production, and we push changes all the way through there along the way. And that's you know and that's one of the nice things about this is that we can treat that according to a sort of standard web development model and not really have to worry about anything we do on the web front end affecting anything on an actual in production system because it's just the front end to view or modify the data. It won't actually affect any changes. Of course, if we break something on the front end, a customer or one of our users goes in and says, hey, I want to change this firewall rule, but something's broken, I can't. That's a different issue. But once changes are made within the front end, you know, assuming it's in production, right, um, they then, next time public runs on a system, so it, it goes, changes are made to the, to the, to the, the, the root Redis database set. It's replicated down to that customer's site. Replication happens all the time because these are all fast connections. Then the system out in the field will puppet will run on it. It'll go to the, the customer's puppet master. The puppet master will do the high recall. It'll look at its local copy of the database. These are all local and they're fast. It's rather significant. And then it'll say, okay, here's my change. Look what I'll make. That's sort of the full life cycle. So there is no testing that happens in there are aging provisions. There's, well, there's a lot of testing that happens in the aging so, so test, you testing. Just have one puppet master, and then you have to pull out. Then what happens? Um, you get have multiple branches, or yes, there is, and we do. I mean, testing happens, you know, on two levels. One, we make a lot of use of our spec within it. So there's a lot of, you know, sort of code level validation. We do a lot of no ops to see whether or not something is, you know, going to change. And then before we we do a standard, a typical puppet release. What will happen is the customer will take, go through a QA process and say, yep, no, this looks good. Thank you for making this change to our Wi-Fi device. Everything looks fantastic. Go ahead and do the release. And then we'll do the release. And furthermore, we can also do um, sets of releases. One of the nice things that really wasn't discussed in here, too, is we organize systems by group. So we can assign groups. Systems can be members of specific groups. So we can say, here's a pilot group, which is going to represent these five systems. And this change that we're making is going to apply only to the group, the pilot group. Go make sure that's all good before we release it to the remaining uh, 2,000 systems, for example. Yeah. What are you using for classified units? Is that also higher? Or how does it know what? How does it know what group it's in? How does it know what group it's in? Yeah, that's a higher function. That's it? Nothing? All right. Well, now we're supposed to do some trivia, I think, for uh, this wonderful prizes. So who are the prizes again, Brian? All right. So we have, uh, what size is there again? There's two larges and small. Two large and small Papa Labs t-shirts. Uh, four velocity t-shirts. There's two extra large and two larges. And then velocity and laptops. giveaways and eight questions. And this is all being done, you know, it's, this is 
is all totally ad hoc and improvised. I haven't thought about this stuff before. Maybe so. not. Maybe think we're in the box. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, so the first, the first question I'll ask is, I mentioned that separation of data and code could be done with Hyra. Obviously, we talked a lot about it, but there's other ways to do it within the public universe. Can anyone remember which one I mentioned about the top threads? No, that's the data store for Hyra. No. What? You can see, right, exactly. Later. Say that to Brazil. Brazil, yeah, two yeah. Brazils. Yeah, so. yeah, did, did you get called up? Well, we can kind of shout it out the back. So. <laughs> <laughs> We're going to describe it. Where is Brazil? Yeah, that's yeah. actually yeah. 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 That's yeah. a tough one. That's a tough one. Please don't just shout out Andrew. <laughs> I'm sorry. That's all right. Yeah, all right. So. Like to 
two or three reasons. Nowhere. Wait a second. What if you change it because you just don't like the person that's going to answer? <laughs> 
Brian You. Village Tavern?